Welcome, everyone. Uh, Yanni Linkola, uh, who recently joined Octoscope, will be presenting uh, today's tutorial. So Yanni is our Senior Director of Marketing. He spent most of his career in operations and engineering in various product development roles, uh, was a fellow of wireless architecture at Altice USA, and most recently worked for Airties, uh, a leading Wi-Fi mesh vendor. So he has lots of experience in the, in the Wi-Fi market. Uh, and of course, he also holds a uh, Master's of Science in Electrical Engineering from the, I had forgot to ask him the pronunciation on this, but the Alto University Helsinki, Finland. So hopefully I got that right. And uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Yanni. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's not too bad, uh, you know, as a, as a first attempt. <laughs> we'll do some private coaching later on. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is today is, is talk about um, um, various testing methodologies that people use uh, in the Wi-Fi industry. Um, and as you know, um, when uh, we start getting a product ready um, uh, to be launched, we typically uh, take it through a a number of different types of um, uh, tests uh, to make sure that it meets the demands of the of the market. Uh, typically, this starts um, in a, in some kind of a lab testing, you know, perhaps performed in a, a test bed, much like uh, the ones uh, that um, Octoscope sells. Um, uh, Quite often, uh, the, the product is then taken uh, into some kind of open air uh, environment, perhaps a test house. And then finally, um, uh, the testing might, uh, or very often uh, involves uh, real uh, end users. You know, some people call this beta tests, friendly user tests. But you know, uh, the type of testing that's, uh, that's performed in, uh, as part of real people's real lives. Um, um, so, the focus, uh, the most of the, the presentation is going to focus on these, these uh, two first. Um, we're going to compare um, these methodologies through three lenses. Um, first of all, um, how repeatable and reproducible are the results um, f uh, when uh, performed either in a test bed or, uh, or in a test house? We're going to look at the speed of the testing, uh, very important aspect, you know, where you live under uh, um, big commercial pressures to get the products out. So the, the, quick, the, the, the faster we can test the, the more, the better it is. And, and finally, we're going to look at how uh, various kinds of uh, real world phenomena can be replicated uh, in this um, test environments. And the whole presentation sort of has an eye of, you know, you know, what are some industry recommended practices, you know, how people uh, perform these tests in, in 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 actuality, and you know how do how do we sort of um, find the uh, the best role for each uh, each type of method so that uh, we can get uh, good quality products out quickly. Um, we're going to use these two words uh, quite a bit uh, during the presentation, so it's perhaps um, useful to just uh, get some uh, definitions out of the way: uh, repeatability and reproducibility. Um, we call a test repeatable when uh, in successive executions uh, for a test case, we get the same result. You know, we, we test, uh, we, we run some sort of a test script, get a result, then, you know, we immediately afterwards run the test again. And, you know, let's say we did do this, you know, five or six times. If we get more or less the same uh, result, we call that test repeatable. Reproducibility is almost the same with a slight variance. Here, we typically uh, are talking about um, a sim similar type of repeatability, but perhaps some change occurs uh, in between the test iterations. They might be taken at a different time, for example. You know, we produced some results last week. You know, we're presenting them to, um, you know, maybe management or something, you know, some results are called into question, you know, can you reproduce these? Well, we go to the same environment again, uh, repeat the results. And if we, if we get the same result, we call that, um, we were able to reproduce. It might be um, not in the same test, uh, a test bed, maybe, maybe we're an ISP and we found some issue and we reported the, the problem to uh, our vendor. 
Now, if the test, uh, if the vendor can use, um, may, they may be using the same exact test bed that we have, you know, just a different instance of it, maybe in a different city. Um, and if we can repeat the test there and get the same result, we call that reproducible. All right. Now, um, a very important aspect to understand about our industry is that um, repeatability and reproducibility of, of a test are ultimately function of two things, right? Uh, the device on the test uh, on the one hand and the test bed itself. And we put a lot of effort and a lot of energy in this industry to, to make sure that the test bed itself uh, has as little uh, variance as possible so that when we do get results and let's say that they are different than from the ones that we got last month if we have high confidence in our test bed in not introducing any variance into the results then we can focus our energy on understanding the difference of the of the test result and we can focus it on the device on the test itself if we have a test bed that introduces a lot of variability then then we end up spending resources you know oh maybe it's the test bed uh, let's look you know uh, and and so it costs a lot of money to to trouble so those type of issues so um, you know, great care is put into making sure that the, the test bed itself is not a factor uh, in any kind of variance that we get out of it. This is, in fact, so important that um, IEEE had an entire working group um, dedicate uh, their time for, uh, for a long time. Um, uh, the working group TGT that worked a few years ago and uh, produced a, a set of recommendations um, uh, to follow in various kinds of testing. They looked in fact at, uh, at six different kinds of environments. And the, and, the, and the purpose was to identify best practices, procedures that would ensure uh, repeatability and reproducibility of results. They looked at um, you know, conducted environments, uh, various kinds of over the air environments, as well as different kinds of um, shielded enclosures. Um, uh, we're going to look at two of these environments in particular uh, because they have two indoor environments that are quite interesting when we look at, you know, the difference between test bed testing and uh, test house testing. So the first environment they call non-line of sight. So this is sort of their set of recommendations as to how one should test uh, in a test house. They say that um, the home, uh, this should be a home. It should be an unoccupied home. Nobody should live there. And it should be built um, out of wood. Uh, there should be no um, active radios, whether, you know, Wi-Fi devices or any kind of other devices that might cause any kind of interference. Um, nowhere in the test house. Um, uh, they, f they go further on to recommend that uh, there should be no people in this test house when the tests are running. Well, obviously, you know, you have to, in between test runs, you might have to go there. But uh, when the test is running, there should be no people within 50 meters. They, they're okay with um, furniture, um, um, you know, doors, um, any kind of loose items. But they say that you should uh, mark the positions in, in which those items are. Uh, so that you can fix them. Uh, let's say somebody comes to the, uh, to the house, maybe sits in a chair, moves it a little bit. Before the next test run, we should be able to return the chair back to its original place. You know, and of course, the, the, the motivation here is to in, take away any kind of variability out of the results. So, you know, a, a moved couch might block the line of sight uh, visibility, um, uh, you know, in a test link. It might you know, there might be some reflections coming out of, um, I don't know, a, a stainless steel appliance if it's changed, etc. They go on, f go on further on to, um, to talk about um, uh, air conditioning, you know, you should fix the temperature, you should fix the, uh, the, the moisture of the air to within a certain uh, range, uh, as well as they go in great lengths to describe um, the usage of turntables. Now, why is this important? Um, well, our devices might have um, some directionality in their antenna patterns, right? There might be a null into some direction or something. You know, we had a, a whole other uh, presentation um, a couple of weeks ago where Lee um, talked about um, antennas. Um, and so anyway, uh, to rule out any scenario where we accidentally uh, direct, let's say, the null to, uh, 
the direction of the link of, uh, let's say, the throughput measurement, um, they recommend that you, you use turntables um, to sort of uh, rule out any kind of e effects like that. And then you average those results out. In fact, they talk about two different types of turntable procedures. They, um, they have uh, what they call stop and uh, um, in a stop motion uh, turntables where um, you, when you run the test, uh, you don't move the turntable, but, but, but then in between tests, you, 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 you turn it. And then they have another protocol where um, uh, the turntables are moving. There's an access point, the, the turntable under the access point, another one uh, under a station. And uh, they even uh, talk about at which rate these uh, turntables should spin. All right, um, the other uh, indoor test environment that they talk about is, or define uh, is what they call the line of sight environment. This uh, is, is effectively an unoccupied floor of an office building. Um, they call for um, there being a, a line of sight unobstructed uh, link for at least 70 meters. You know, this is a, this is a long, we're talking about a big industrial space here. Uh, again, you know, no Wi-Fi devices or any kind of interferers. Um, they also um, uh, say that uh, you shouldn't have any reflective surfaces or obstructions within the first Fresnel zone of the uh, of the test link. Again, uh, same recommendations on uh, air conditioning and turntables. Um, so that's IEEE saying. Well, here are some best practices that should ensure highly repeatable and reproducible uh, results. Let's look at the, um, the state of the art uh, as how this is practiced today by various organizations. We, we spend um, actually a few days um, browsing through, trying to find um, material where, uh, where people publicly um, speak about um, their test house uh, testing procedures. We, we found quite a bit of material. Um, these were either from device manufacturers. Uh, there was quite a few labs that were marketing their services. You know, here's, you know, we could do test house testing for you. Here's some of our test houses. And, um, and then we found also a couple of, con you know, sort of not quite labs, but more like consulting companies that also um, do this type of testing, uh, uh, testing for hire. In fact, I have myself personally been in this business in the past. Um, yeah, as a partner of a, of a consulting company. Uh, uh, we had a line of business in this, in this space as well. So I'm, I have quite a bit of experience in this space. So I suppose, um, so here's some pictures uh, from the material that we, we were able to find. This is all publicly available. You know, I'm not disclosing anything that uh, anybody couldn't find themselves. And, and I suppose the first um, observation is that people are indeed using real homes. Um, what's interesting is there. Uh, the, 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 the recommendation on wood frame buildings is not strictly followed. Um, you know, we see clearly, you know, brick uh, buildings and, and uh, buildings made of, out of concrete in this sample. And that's kind of understandable if you think about it, right? Um, if if um, in your local market, buildings are mostly made out of brick or concrete, then why would you go and test in a, in a, in a wood frame building? It doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's, it makes sense for the test house to reflect, you know, the sort of the local um, construction uh, practices. Now, if we look inside the houses, um, we do see um, furniture, uh, loose items, um, you know, the, these, these places look like homes, you know, they, there's televisions and, and you know, coffee makers and microwave ovens. Uh, we don't see people consistently following the idea of marking things in their places. Some people do that, many people don't. Um, so there seems to be some, some, some freedom a, a, around that. Um, further, uh, in a lot of the material we see people in fact, people using uh, what clearly are Wi-Fi devices. So that's interesting. Remember, IEEE said there should be people within 50 meters and certainly no Wi-Fi radios. So, so this is sort of a, a little bit curious, but if you think about it for a second, it's really quite understandable, right? Um, there's a lot of activity in, in, in making sure that the tests run. Even if you have automated your system very well, there's gonna be glitches in the system and just the smooth operation of the test house basically requires a test engineer or two 
to be present. And it's understandable that they use uh, uh, computers. Uh, you know, the, the system needs to be controlled. Um, uh, you know, the tests need to be run and computers usually the user interface that you do that. In fact, they probably also have, you know, internal clients, you know, management asking, well, you know, how's the testing going? You know, are there any big bugs that I should be aware of? So they, they probably do internal reporting as the testing is in progress. So clearly sort of varying protocols are followed. Um, now, I'm not saying everybody's doing it this way. Some, some people are... Um, uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, uh, strictly following the IEEE recommendations. So, but the organizations that are a little bit more loose, um, you know, they in fact say that, uh, you know, this, this type of um, um, variability is in fact kind of welcome, right? Uh, if you think about our, our devices are going to be used in a, in a home and there's going to be variance in, uh, in the home. So uh, to have some variance in, the, in, the, in your test environment in, in, is in fact, not such a bad thing, you know. Uh, perhaps individual test executions, as you as you as you do them one after another, perhaps they're not perfectly repeatable. But as long as you uh, take the same test a few times, maybe you repeat it six times or a, or a dozen times, if you can achieve, if you if the average is repeatable, then you still have control uh, over your um, test procedure, and you can sort of uh, trust the results, right? So. So these unknown and uncontrolled parameters to a degree seem to be in fact uh, welcomed. Um, now, um, turntables, um, not everybody is using turntables. That seems to be kind of rare. Uh, you know, some people are um, here on the, on the right, we have a, a picture from uh, courtesy of Dot 11 Labs, one uh, uh, Wi-Fi testing uh, uh, company that, that sells their services, they uh, are uh, using turntables here in the picture. In fact, that's um, a sort of a modified uh, octoscope uh, turntable that they've taken out, the, out in the field and, and modified it for the purposes of uh, .11t testing. Um, there, uh, there are robots, people are using robots as well. Here on the, here on the left, we have a, a very cool looking robot uh, moving uh, devices around uh, in the test house. We, uh, this seems to be you know, um, on, on wheels and probably has some sort of an optical navigation system. We hear stories about rail-based systems uh, where people move de test devices in the houses um, using um, you know, monorails and, and, and the such. Um, some of this testing, uh, even uh, involving ro robotics, is, is stop motion testing only. Some other organizations also do um, uh, motion testing while uh, or testing while the, the devices are, uh, are moving. So, all right, so there was sort of um, one set of recommendations coming from IEEE, you know, how you get repeatable and re reproducible results. Uh, folks are following it to a degree. Some, you know, the, your mileage varies. So let's look at what that might mean um, in, in practice. Like how much variance are we really talking about? Um, so we, I'm going to show you two data sets. Uh, one was uh, performed by myself uh, in, a, in, in a past life where I was, um, I was doing these type of um, test house projects a little bit. Um, uh, there's nothing special about this test case. I mean, I have the, the, you know, dozens of these samples, but just to show a data set. Um, it, this was done a couple of years ago with an old uh, ACES model. Um, it, we, just, I'm just going to show a one test point where I, you know, I had a MacBook Air and did some iPerf measurements and, and executed the test um, a few times. This was performed uh, in, a, in a duplex apartment in a, in a very densely built city. So you're going to see some variability in the results. Um, I, I performed a download test um, at some distance. Um, you know, I did it on 5 gigahertz as well as on 2.4 gigahertz. And as you can see, the 5 gigahertz data set is is fairly consistent, right? You get 20 executions of the test, same, same test case, give pretty much the same result. The 2.4 gigahertz band in this environment was very, very congested. I mean, we're, we're talking congestion of airtime, easily you know, 40%, if not more, depending on, on, on time. And so as a result, you see a lot of variance in the results as well. The mean looks like about 100, but you, 100 megabits per second, but you see, you know, uh, variance uh, uh, over um, and above. Above and below. Um, we have another data set here that was um, 
now done uh, in a controlled uh, test bed. Um, this particular case, um, we sort of tried to roughly replicate the previous scenario, but just do it in a test bed. So we used attenuators to sort of reach a similar type of speeds. And, and again, we, we execute um, the test here 20 times. In this particular data set, uh, we, we run everything um, uh, uh, with nothing changing uh, during, the, during the minute. So we, 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 uh, we have the attenuator set up at, at certain levels. We run the test for a minute, uh, take an average speed throughout the minute, and then redo that 20 times. And as you can see, you get an incredibly uh, stable result. I mean, there's some variance, but it's like fractions of a percent. It's 0.02 percent uh, to be exact. Um, now, um, here's a second data set also done uh, in a test bed. Uh, this is slightly different test procedure. This is, um, you know, what, what people in the industry call a, a rate versus range test. So, so essentially, um, there is, um, in this test setup, there is um, a, a, an access point and a station, and, and a single throughput measurement is going uh, on uh, throughout the test. But what we do is we uh, attenuate the air link uh, using 5 uh, dB steps uh, along that throughput test. And we do that, um, I think the step uh, was 10 seconds in this particular case. And what's happening um, is um, as the uh, link budget changes um, uh, through during the test, the MAC layers of the two radios adapt to that change. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the dB change is almost instantaneous, you know, talking about milliseconds here, but the, the MAC layer takes a little bit of time to adapt to that. And then the throughput test procedure itself adapts to the MAC layer adaptation. So there's a, there's a little bit of changing variables here uh, in the result. And, and what we are reporting here are five runs of, of rate versus range test. And we're looking at the individual five dB steps even when this change happens during the test and even when each individual step is only 10 seconds, we still get very little variation, uh, about 0.2% um, uh, in this case. So, so this is kind of expected, right? Uh, repeatability and reproducibility are in fact designed into this type of test bed itself. You know, um, in the in the Octobox case, uh, you know, we have we're using highly isolated construction. Uh, you know, this eliminates any kind of variability from the outside. We're we're using RF absorbing foam inside the chamber to create a, a semi anechoic environment. Um, it basically reduces the multi-path effects to almost nothing. Uh, maybe you get a couple of reflections, but uh, the signal is so attenuated at that point that there's very little uh, multi-path ha happening inside the uh, environment. We we have some connections to the outside for, uh, world, you know, electricity, for example, but it's through uh, filtered ports. So no uh, interference can, is injected through those ports. And of course, um, the, the entire test procedure is done using software controllable uh, test instruments, uh, software and scripts, so no human needs to touch the device uh, or the test bed itself when, the, when these tests are, um, are performed. And in fact, we also have a, a turntable, you know, in case we want to do any kind of um, orientation style testing. So uh, because the because the repeatability is built into the environment results, it's not a surprise that in fact you do get repeatable results. All right, um, so that was um, uh, sort of um, uh, the repeatability uh, lens. Let's look at some um, aspects related to um, speed uh, of testing. Um, in order to sort of set this up, um, Let's say let's let's imagine a scenario where we're perhaps interested in in the performance of an access point. You know, perhaps we have a new product that we're uh, we're interested in launching, and we want to characterize the performance of that product. So, typically, this type of effort involves a couple of different dimensions of 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 um, of uh, real world use case. You know, and we run into this problem that I call the n by n by n problem. So, what do I mean by that? Well. You know, a, a performance of an access point, you know, really is a function of, well, you know, we might be interested in looking at 
how it performs in 2.4 gigahertz, how it performs in five. You know, we might be interested in the uplink performance, downlink performance of, of, of different kinds of stations. You know, we might be interested in a, in a high end, let's say a laptop that has a, a multi MIMO capability, maybe a, a medium uh, device, maybe like a smartphone and maybe a legacy device. Maybe, maybe we're interested in the common, a joint performance of all of these devices mixed uh, in. Um, certainly, we're interested in distance and, and sort of different locations in a home. You know, how, do, how does it perform when the, when the station is close by, a little bit further away, you know, kind of in the far end corner. And um, to rule out any orientation issues, you know, we might be interested in um, a few uh, turntable positions. So with this example alone, you know, if you, if, you, if you test all of the permutations of all of these variables, you end up with 288 test scenarios. You know, nothing unheard of people do this type of characterization uh, every day of the week. So that's, that's a lot of work. And let's say we do it, you know, for the, for the purposes of building an argument here, let's just say we do it manually in, an, in a test house where we have some background interference. So, so we're interested in repeating each of those 288 test cases. And let's say we use a super simple test protocol where we, we spend a minute executing the test. You know, we spend a minute checking the results, saving results, uh, making sure that everything's going smoothly. Repeat that cycle six times and then spend another two minutes uh, of reconfiguration and what have you before we go to one of those other 288 test scenarios. With this type of test protocol performed manually, the data collection in our example alone takes almost two weeks. You know, 67 and a half hours of, of data collection time, assuming you, you, ha you don't have to repeat anything, right? That's, you know, taking breaks and everything. That's, that's practically two weeks of, uh, of data collection. Now, at the end of that two weeks, all you have is a bunch of um, uh, test results files, you know, close to 2,000, in fact. And you'd have another 2,000 um, uh, PCAP files, let's say you took, um, uh, you know, Wi-Fi um, interface traces as well. So it turns out when you do this manually, uh, and I've done this a lot, um, it's extremely easy to make mistakes during this test. You know, you forget to execute one of the 288 scenarios, maybe. Maybe you do execute it, but, but you had the devices misconfigured. It wasn't quite the scenario that you were intending to test. You know, maybe you did test it, but you lost the files, or maybe you didn't lose the files, but you named them wrongly. So later on, when somebody, you know, is looking at the, the entire campaign, it's um, sort of a little bit unclear what result files correspond to what test case. Now, typically, and very often in that type of protocol, um, the person doing the post-processing is not the same person uh, doing the data collection. So it turns out that if you do have uh, uh, remaining mistakes in your data set, it's very difficult to spot them. I mean, it takes hours of looking at the data and making sure that everything looks good, you know, tests that are taken further away from the access point, you know, that they are in fact showing low, lower speeds and things like that. And, and it takes a lot of energy to find those mistakes, but, but in, a, in a test campaign like this, it's almost guaranteed that you'll, you'll, you'll have some mistakes. And so you'll end up sending the data collection teams out there in the field, you know, for another day or two, just to uh, uh, make sure that, uh, that we have uh, full, uh, full files. And, and you know, post-processing this into a report takes a lot of energy. Now, Compare that uh, doing the same type of characterization in a test bed, right? We have uh, we have software controllable instruments. Yeah, they can, you know, we have instruments that can look like access points, can look like different kinds of stations. We, you know, in this test, they can look like a high-end Wi-Fi six device, and five seconds later, we can configure them to look like an an old. Uh, uh, legacy device, you know, that supports maybe ABGN on 2.4 gigahertz only. Um, uh, because we know that the, the tests are highly repeatable, we don't have to re uh, repeat the test. We, we only test a, a, a test once. And in fact, we can even shorten the time window from a minute to just a few seconds because we, we have such high confidence in the result. So the bottom line is that the same campaign that took um, two weeks to collect two weeks to collect the time and maybe another week um, into post processing this collapses into a project of maybe one or two hours uh, and, and we have high confidence in the result 
because you know uh, there was no humans involved in making mistakes. And in fact, we have even packet captures for everything if, if there's some interesting uh, post analysis that, uh, that needs to occur, right? Um, so, of course, what I was talking about there was the, the really the benefits of automation. So, of course, uh, people can and in fact have automated um, test house testing procedures um, so that they get many of the same benefits. Now, you still run into um, uh, issues, uh, you know, you have to repeat perhaps the test test cases a few times and, and um, you know, but, but um, yeah, it, it, unless you automate these things, uh, it's, you're going to run into a lot of problems. Problems. Now, finally, let's look at um, the the ability of a methodology to replicate real world uh, phenomena uh, in, in the world. This is important, right? Um, testing in, in in a testing phase of a product, um, you know, perhaps we're we're launching a, a, a new product that may be deployed in the hundreds of thousands or millions in the field. We want to make sure and expose the product early on to as many scenarios as possible. Uh, why? Because we, we want to see if, if the uh, device under test exhibits any kind of weird behavior or, or bugs uh, in, in certain scenarios, right? So um, if we catch them early in the testing, then fixing the bugs is going to be a lot quicker, a lot cheaper, and we're going to have more happy customers in the end that uh, maybe uh, re may make uh, repeat purchases uh, in the future. So with that in mind, let's have a, a real look at these test houses that, that we, we looked at before. So we said that the test houses uh, reflect the uh, local uh, market conditions and to a degree that makes sense, uh, but that causes um, a, a, an issue. Um, let's say you're an ISP, let's say in the USA, but your vendor may uh, be established in another, another country. They may not have access to um, a similar test house as what you are using here. And um, you know this might cause an issue of reproducibility between your organization and the organization that's supporting you. Hence, I think I triply recommended the usage of wood houses. You know, wood houses are the sort of the cheapest form of uh, of construction, so uh, probably there's more wood houses uh, uh, out there in the world than, than many others. Um, uh, but if we look at a little bit uh, more closely these houses, there's there's clear selection bias here going on, right? These are big houses. Um, you know, they're they're not. These are these are pl you know places where you know the wealthy people would buy. That, that causes. A, I mean, it's sort of understandable, right? Because in a testing scenario, we want to uh, test um, test cases that that happen a little bit further away uh, from the access point. So it's uh, of course useful to have a, um, a long distance uh, a possibility uh, in the testing, but it causes uh, the selection bias problem. And and you know, as we all know, big houses come with big lots, right? So. Um, we're not really going to, if, if our argument um, uh, surrounding the test house testing is that we want to test our products in, in sort of typical environments, then these are not typical environments at all um, in, in where our products is, is really going to be, be used. You know, there's very little apartments, for example, that people use, but, you know, people live a, a lot in apartments, especially in cities. Um, the other problem is that, you um, most testing organizations really only have one or two test houses. You know, they don't really necessarily have the business to sustain more. Now, some testing organizations have have many houses. You know, we know of companies that run even a dozen. But the challenge that comes with these type of things is th due to logistical issues, any single test campaign is usually only executed in one te test home only, or perhaps it's the work is split be between two, but it's very difficult to split a single test campaign, you know, in between 12 uh, test houses. That requires a whole other level of automation and coordination. That's, that's difficult to do, not impossible, but, uh, you know, people haven't made those investments yet. Um, so anyways, uh, but, um, Maybe uh, just raise the abstraction level a little bit and, 
and see, well, you know, we're interested in, in testing um, real world phenomena, but what might those real world phenomena be? Um, uh, so um, let's take again the example uh, that let's say we're, uh, we have an access point here and we want to expose uh, that access point in the testing phase to as many real world phenomena as we can. So what are some of those real world phenomena? Well, number one, the access point is likely going to be interacting with lots and lots of different kinds of stations. You know, there's just a vast variety. Um, you know, high-end devices, low-end devices, legacy, new ones, you know, there's different output power levels, beamforming, MIMO, you know, the Wi-Fi industry is, is now um, over 20 years old. So, you know, you're going to find a lot of different kinds of devices. Um, uh, there's the question of distance from the access point. So, you know, we want to uh, look at the performance close by and further away. There is um, the uh, phenomenon of mobility, right? Especially very relevant with, uh, with mesh uh, products. Um, you know, there's handovers in between the mesh nodes. Um, there's various kinds of multipath environments out there. Uh, with Wi-Fi 6 and with OFDMA, um, you know, the, the first uh, sort of uh, efficiency-oriented Wi-Fi standard, test cases involving lots of different kind of stations uh, transmitting simultaneously becomes uh, important because um, you know, the OFDMA radio interface performance is really stress tested in, in, in an environment where there's a, there's a lot of different stations sort of uh, competing for the, for the air uh, bandwidth. Of course, there's different kind of interference scenarios, co-channel, adjacent channel, maybe high priority interferers, certainly a lot of uh, interferers that are not Wi-Fi at all. And then uh, the introduction of mesh, uh, which is now happening in quite big numbers out there um, uh, introduces a, a whole other dimension of problems, right? You know, uh, how many mesh nodes do I have? Uh, one, two, three, more, you know, what kind of backhaul do I, am I using? Wireless, wired, maybe, you know, do I have a dual band or do I have a dedicated uh, radio for my backhaul? Various kinds of test scenarios that, that would, be, uh, would be good to test. And of course, you know, backhaul now has uh, its own interference uh, considerations. So um, this, in this table, I'm sort of trying to summarize sort of our views uh, of uh, the testing methodology's ability to, to, to replicate these phenomena. So the, so the 12 uh, dimensions of real-worldness, if you will, from the previous slide are now horizontal rows in this table. And we have two columns, one uh, representing uh, the octoscope test bed and the other one representing a test house. And we, we're using color code here, uh, green meaning that, uh, that we believe that that kind of real world phenomenon is easily replicated in that test environment. You know, devices and, and automation exists. Uh, uh, red means there's some fundamental issues uh, with the testing methodology and the and the level of the, the real world phenomenon and then yellow um, sort of well let's talk about the yellow in a second so uh, focus on the red right these are all the interference scenarios uh, with the test has so so if you if you have a test house that's uh, in a densely built environment you're going to have interference coming from that environment and and while you of course can inject new interference into your test scenario it's gonna it's gonna sum with the backload back background interference and so you don't really have interference under control right um, so hence we can't really say that you can sort of fully capture real world phenomena uh, like that now let's say you have your test houses in a in a more of a rural setting with uh, with no um, uh, houses nearby and let's say you follow these IEEE recommendations to the letter where you have no people, you know, no radios, then uh, you could certainly do this. But you run into this other problem that, that we mark here by yellow. So uh, essentially what we're saying is, is uh, a lot of different kind of testing is possible in a test house, but it very quickly becomes kind of complicated to execute. Um, not going to go through all of it, but let's just, let me give you a, a couple of examples. Like, let's look at the top two rows there, right? So, um, the the question of the device type, right? We we see in in um, you know the the 
the test house uh, service providers that, that market their services make claims like, well, you know, in our test houses, we have a, a hundred different kind of stations. So you're able to test your system against uh, any and every kind of device out there. Well, that's impressive, right? A hundred different kind of devices to test, but just think about automating that, right? To just get a traffic generator client onto all of those devices to make sure that they are, they are powered and, and on and configured with the, with the right settings, you know, is a, is a complexity all on its own. Now, let's take the question of distance from the access point. So now, now we're moving, what we're moving a hundred devices from, uh, from location to location. You know, let's say we're interested in, 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 in the performance in six or 10 different uh, locations. Well, that's a lot of movement. You know, we need those, we need those robots uh, or somehow otherwise uh, do it. And, and let's just say we were in, even interested in, in mobility. So anyway, um, it becomes very complicated very quickly. Um, and um, uh, you're going to have to ask yourself, well, how am I going to run this automation now? Our point of view and uh, uh, things that um, our um, our customers have done is they have um, we sell quite a bit of uh, of our equipment to these organizations where um, uh, you know you can take for example in this particular case the customer has bought a, a turntable from us and and they they've they've put it on a cart uh, that can then be used uh, in a test home. You know, we have uh, our um, uh, server here uh, also uh, installed on the same uh, uh, cart. And, and, and now, you can, you, now you can bring a fully software controllable turntable that's, you know, well designed for, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, into your test environment. Uh, in this particular picture, we have a customer that's taken uh, one of our um, PAL test instruments. You know, this is the the device that can act either as an access point or various kinds of stations and 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 sort of uh, we've we've uh, made a field version of it with uh, with a bunch of antennas so uh, as you think about automating your test house test procedures uh, it's quite it, it becomes it makes a lot of sense to to reuse investments that the companies like us have, have already made because you know we have the instruments they're all software controllable we have uh, you know servers running software uh, test scripts so um, you don't have to sort of reinvent the wheel and and and, and can use uh, the investments that, that that we have made so to wrap things up um, uh, we think that the test bed testing is a, is, a, is a very good method for sort of your baseline repetitive tests. You do get highly reproducible results that you can trust. It is by far the fastest method out of the, uh, the three. And uh, it can uh, reproduce almost any real world phenomenon that you can, you can pretty much think of. I mean, um, Having been uh, participating in these type of projects a lot, you know, let's say you start getting some signal from the marketplace that, uh, you know, that maybe there's some new uh, strange behavior that 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 uh, customers uh, call you about. Uh, a lot more time typically is spent in understanding the problem, you know, reading trouble tickets, talking to the CSR person that that talk to the customer, maybe perhaps. Uh, talking to the customer itself. A lot more time is spent in this area. Once you understand the phenomenon and 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 know actually what, what happens in there, it's usually not a problem to replicate that test in a test bed. So that, uh, you know, from now on, uh, you're going to test that before, before launch. Now, on the other hand, uh, on the other end, uh, friendly user testing, we didn't talk about this a lot, but it's it's an absolute must uh, usually in these type of projects. It's it's the best methodology to find these new surprising test scenarios. You know, a, a couple of years ago, I, I was involved in a project where um, we started getting reports that a certain type of uh, Wi-Fi controllable electrical plug um, was was causing issues in the in the marketplace. You know, no way we would ever learn about this this product, but it turned out that. Uh, I think it was Costco had started selling a lot of these and suddenly the market was flooded with these devices that they all had, you know, weird Wi-Fi before. How are you going to find this uh, unless you do uh, friendly user testing? The issue with this is that you get 
you know, sort of qualitative, qualitative, not quantitative results. You know, they're, they're very fuzzy reports, and so you have to spend a lot of time understanding what the issues are. It is the slowest and the most expensive method of the three, but you can't really admit it. Now, test house testing, we believe, um, is a sort of a, a good intermediate step to, to, to take uh, as you move from testbed testing to friendly user testing. It's, it's really great for prototyping these test scenarios that you, you get from friendly users and from the marketplace, you know, to, uh, to sort of try to characterize the problem and, and understand what's going on so that with the eye on, on being able to then replicate the test in a test bed. <coughs> it's also a useful step as a sort of a sanity check as you, uh, as you go from uh, test bed testing to the market, you know, maybe there are people in, in your organization that, you know, aren't as, you know, familiar with, with what, what's going on in the test bed. It's, it's sort of useful to, to gain wider confidence in the product to, to, to test it in an, in an open environment as well. You know, you can make the argument that, look, we, we got this result in the, in the test bed. We got the same exact result in a, in a test house. So therefore, you can trust this data and this report. Um, there are issues uh, in 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 in, a, in testing in a test house unless you automate things to a to a high degree. This will be a big investment, uh, but if you use instruments uh, that you're familiar with, with uh, from a test bed, you can reduce this investment cost uh, quite radically. So. That concludes um, the presentation. Um, I didn't hear any questions uh, or... Uh... So we, we do have one question that just came up from Alec. Um, he's asking, do companies use test offices to test how their device under test operates in an office? Office environment is different than a home's. Uh, they do. I mean, uh, yeah, folks like... Uh, it, it, it depends on what kind of market you you um, uh, test for. So I'm more familiar with the consumer electronic side of the market. So that test is almost exclusively done in, in, in homes. But of course, you know, there's vendors like Cisco and, you know, the target more the enterprise market. So they're more interested in, in testing, um, uh, you know, in an office-like environment. So I, I would suspect that they have this uh, IEEE line of sight type of environment uh, replicated uh, in some I, I, I personally some. tested in an office and it was an empty office that uh, we, we rented uh, and uh, there were just cubes but no people working there. There was no line of sight but you know, there were larger, longer distances, and and you're right. It's a very different environment. We got more range in that environment. But yeah. I remember struggling if we were testing late into the evening, and then we would come back in the morning. We could not get the same measurements. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's it was that's, still hard. Yeah, yeah. These are congested office environments, as we know, are highly congested during the daytime. So, yeah, it's. Uh, is difficult. Also, I mean, there's also lower output power, so that's another um, sort of thing that factors into into that sort of testing. But um, yep, I'd say uh, when when I when I was uh, searching for the material regarding uh, you know this test house service providers, certainly most of them market um, uh, to the consumer side of the electronics industry. Not sure why. All right. Well, if there's no further questions, uh, 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 you know, we thank you for uh, attending. Uh, um, we're, we keep doing this uh, as long as you show up. Uh, um, we're thinking the next uh, topic um, will be mesh networks. It's a, it's a kind of a hot topic in, in our industry right now. Uh, lots of ISPs are um, launching mesh products. They're not quite yet super widely deployed, you know, maybe a percentage or two uh, penetration into the base, but we see this as a, as a sort of a watershed moment where probably that's going to change. So certainly something that we keep thinking about here at Octoscope uh, as to uh, what are some problems uh, in that space and, and how might one build good test procedures to capture the essential phenomena.
uh, in mesh networks. I'm not seeing other questions. Uh, I guess that being said, I guess we uh, again thank everybody and um, just remember all these uh, seminars <coughs> are recorded and will be available uh, as soon as we um, as soon as we process this one. So again, thanks for attending. We'll see you next time.